Okay, I did not change this this time. So on Friday, we talked about density and pressure. And today we're going to continue on talking about pressure and get to Pascal's principle and Archimedes' principle. Now, before we get started, I want to just do something that I find very cool that is totally what we're learning. So this year, surprisingly enough, a piece of rubber, right? Yeah, put on here, it holds it up. Why does it hold it up? Okay, I have an answer of suction. This is fundamentally a suction cup. It's also a suction cup with a leak, so it won't hold it forever. Now, let's, uh, let's try, who thinks that they're a, a skookum person, a strong person? Okay, Andy, come back up here, Andy, you vacated. it. Okay, try to lift that straight up. Okay, she got it, but was it easy? No. No. Why was it hard, once again? Suction. Suction. So what is going on with a suction cup? Which is what this fundamentally is. Ideas? Pressure is holding it. Okay, you said pressure is holding it. That's right. If you look at, now this here is just a, a cheesy physics lab suction cup. Normal suction cups are, are developed to make this work a little more efficiently. But what you have is a piece of rubber. And that piece of rubber, you notice I could easily lift it up if I took it sideways, right? But if I take it straight up, pick it up. What it's doing is it's forming a seal. Not a perfect seal, obviously, but it's forming a seal underneath it. So when I try to lift this up from the center, it will deform just a little bit and create a cavity. And so you probably all either in high school or in chemistry somewhere learn simple things like the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. So if the temperature remains constant, if the volume the gas is filling increases, what happens to the pressure? If the volume is increased. If the volume increases, because you went from having virtually no gap in there to it forming up to have a gap. Then the pressure decreases. Then the pressure decreases. So you're going to have a low pressure on bottom. And atmospheric pressure on top. And so all you have to do is say, well, what's the force caused by air, the net force caused by air? And the net force caused by air is going to be force down equals pressure atmosphere times area, and force up equals pressure low times area. So the net force... If we're in equilibrium, the net force will be zero. And so that means that the, the lifting force is force down minus force up, or pressure atmosphere times area minus pressure low times area. So it's the pressure difference times the area. So that's how much you know, upward force I have to have to lift this. And so what's going to happen is the pressure underneath, is go it's going to sag enough to make the pressure underneath the right amount to hold this thing up. And so if I try harder, you can see that the gap gets bigger. It's making a bigger volume, hence a lower pressure, and thus getting more force. So a suction cup works like this, except for suction cups are designed to make it so you have a lower pressure always. So how is a suction cup designed? Cross section, they're designed something like this. And so you push them down and you push the air out. 
And then if it seals, it tries to come back up. And so it has, you know, based on its elasticity, a lower pressure always under there. Hence, it's always sticking on there. So you can't just easily slide it off like I can with mine. So how suction cups work? Kind of cool, right? And absolutely the kind of thing we're learning in class. All right, let's move forward. What causes the air pressure around us? The weight of the air on top of us. So air pressure is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. By the way, just for grins, this is like what? About eight inches by eight inches, so 64 square inches. That means the air pressure pushing down on this is 64 square inches times 14.7 pounds. Real quick, what's 64 times, let's say 15, just for round numbers? 64 times 15 is 960. 960. 960. 9, 16. 9, 16. So? 64 times 15. 64 times 15. 64 times 15. 9, 64 times 15. 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, don't think she achieved that as much as she's, you know, feeling good about herself. Because air pressure, actually that's a lot of force it puts over a surface. You take the top of my head, the top of my head is similar. I've got almost a thousand pounds of force pushing down on the top of my head due to the weight of the air above me. Let's stop and think about the weight of the air above me. How can the weight, how can the air above me have a weight? It has mass, it's in a gravitational field. So why is it up there and not on the surface of the Earth? Not enough. Okay, it's a gas. You said density. Density really is a key. That air is floating, if you will, above the surface of the Earth. Higher air is floating on the lower air. And so all of weather is driven by the variations in density of floating. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start, though, with something simple. If I have a container of water like this, we know that there's air pressure on top, and so that air pressure is putting a force on the top of the water. What direction is the force the air pressure is putting on the top of the water? Pushing down. Pushing down, because the force is always in what direction? Always into the surface. The force due to pressure is always into the surface. Hmm? That is the normal direction, yes. Did you say normal? Yeah. Okay, so as I go deeper, what's happening to the weight of the air and water above me? It's increasing. So the pressure is increasing because of the increased weight. Now, as long as I have a nice uniform cylinder, the calculation is very simple. I'm just going to have the increase in weight is the volume times the density. That's remember mass. Density is mass per volume. So mass is equal to volume times density times g. So if I take this, I can say, okay, the weight that is in here, the area times height is the volume. And so that volume, the mass is equal to volume times density because definition density is mass over volume. And so the weight, just using the symbol there, is equal to mg is equal to m, oh, excuse me, I wanted to replace that with v rho g. But then the volume, since it's area times height, is area times height times rho times g. That's the weight. What's pressure? What's the equation for pressure? Well, the, the, the simple one that we've learned. That's moving forward. Force over area. And so I think this is actually where Randy was going, was the solution we get from this. 
that the pressure is rho gh. Now, if I want to be really careful, which I should be, right? I'm a teacher. I should have put the change in pressure is equal to the additional weight, which would be A times delta H rho G. And so it's rho G delta H. So the true equation is the change in pressure as you go down in depth in a fluid is equal to rho G H, where H is the depth you are in that fluid. It's the change in pressure because at the top, the pressure was atmosphere. As you go down, it's going to increase from atmosphere to bigger and bigger values. This was a nice vertical column. We said, well, Russell said, Russell, you had a question. What was your question? Does the ocean count as a nice vertical column for this equation? Does what? The ocean count as a nice vertical column for this equation? Okay, that actually plays into where I'm going. Russell had said that air pressure is due to the weight of the air above us. Well, how much air is above my head right now? There's a roof between me and most of that. Right? So the roof is holding up all the other air. Right? That's not coming down to me. And so you say, okay, meter and a half. Well, how is it that a meter and a half can give me that same air pressure as it would be outside? Because you know, when we open the door and I go outside, there is not a big difference in pressure. Remember, pressure is force over air. If there's a big difference in pressure, well, like let's say you're in an airplane and all of a sudden the door flies off, the pressure outside is much lower because it's much higher, and thus the weight of the air above is less. And what do you see in the movies? Things go flying out. To some extent, they do, because you have low pressure on the outside, high pressure on the inside, just like when we talk about this, low pressure here means a small force that way. High pressure here means a big force that way, and it goes away from the high pressure. Rapid decompression. Yes, and you have rapid decompression. So we don't have that when we open the door. So we know that the air pressure here is basically the same as outside. True, air handling systems in modern buildings try to keep a slight positive pressure. They try to keep the pressure inside the building slightly higher than the pressure outside. That way, you don't have that hot or cold air out there kind of creeping in. If you have little leaks, as you do, it's going out. Okay, so back to, back to the topic there. How is it that I have the same air pressure here when I only have like a meter and a half of air above my head, whereas I go out there and I have, you know, 10 miles of air above my head? The key is in pressure is not a vector or a tensor like stress is. It's what we call hydrostatic. It's the same in all directions. And so the air pressure out there is not just pushing air down, it's also pushing air sideways. And so it pushes sideways into the building and it transmits. So as long as you have a continuous system, no stoppages, then you'll have the pressure equalized. So at this elevation, you have the same pressure as you would if you were outside. Now, if you have different density things, it can change. So this thing here is supposed to illustrate that. It's leaking like, well, like something that leaks a lot. Yeah. I was going to say a sieve. OK. So the point of this is to be that you have, and of course, I ran out of the food coloring here because that's where I put it in and it all went out once. Notice I have some air bubbles in there. I'm going to get air bubbles out as much as I can. <laughs> Most of them are out. Okay, but the, uh, the height of these is very similar. Not exactly the same, but very similar. Why? Because they should have the same air pressure on the outside, and so they're going to have the same depth to get down here because they all have the same pressure down here as well. Why are they not exactly the same? What? Okay, let's pretend there are not air bubbles. That, that, that's not the goal. I mean, it is a factor. What else? Area. 
That, that's why they should be the same. It's something you learn about in chemistry a lot. You learn about things like a meniscus. What causes a meniscus? Capillary. What is capillary? Okay. The, you have cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is a force between like substances. So water has a cohesive force and attraction to other water molecules. Then you have adhesion, a force between dissimilar things. So in this case, it would be between water and glass. And that yeah. adhesive force is stronger than the cohesive force. That is, the water has more attraction to glass than it does to other water molecules. This means that it's going to have lower energy if it's touching glass than it has if it's not touching glass. And so everything in nature, we've learned two ways of solving dynamics problems. One of them was Newton's second law, and one was work energy. Work energy is really nice because you can use it in a lot of situations where you couldn't ever try to teach, uh, treat it with forces. Everything is going to try to go to its lowest available potential energy. And so that water is going to try to touch the glass, and it will climb up so its gravitational potential energy goes up because it has lower potential energy touching that glass that does not touch the glass. So that's what causes capillarity. That's what causes it to creep up on the edge of the glass. Now, if we go differently, what would happen if this was mercury instead of water? The meniscus would be inverted. Now, based on the explanation we just had for capillarity, why would the meniscus be inverted? Okay, because it is not as strongly attracted to glass. Its adhesion is not as strong as its cohesion to water. And so it actually tries to pull away from the glass to have lower energy. So you have two things that this is illustrating. What it's supposed to be is they're all roughly the same height. But then you have, they're not exactly the same because of capillarity. And if it's a smaller tube, the amount of gravitational change per amount you go up is smaller because, of course, there's less volume going up when you go up, let's say, a millimeter. And so the capillarity will make the smaller tube rise a little bit higher than the bigger tube. Yeah, we have lots of, lots of demos here. That's all important stuff. It's all stuff that is things that you should know about and be able to answer questions on. But the actual point of this slide was the pressure difference with depth is rho. What does rho stand for? Density. And what is the symbol for rho? Or what is the symbol for rho? What does the symbol rho look like? Looks kind of like a script P. It's a Greek letter. So density rho times G, the acceleration due to gravity times the depth difference. Now, here's a picture of a dam. Why is the dam wider at the bottom than the top? There's plenty of reasons. What are some that come to mind? Because the water pressure is greater at the bottom because the weight of the air and the weight of the water pushes it down even more. Okay. The water pressure increases with depth. And because the water pressure increases with depth, that means that the force that's being put on the dam is also increasing with depth because that force is pressure times area. So you have more force being pushed at the bottom, which means you need something that's stronger to withstand it. Okay, to take the weight of the rest of the dam. I, I think this is related to what I wanted to go with next. You have... <laughs> You're going to have a torque involved here. I have a force that's pushing. What direction is the force of the water pushing on the dam? Into it. Pushing into it. I'm a genius. I got my keyboard wet. Okay, so we have the force of the water is pushing like that. And note, the force is getting bigger at the bottom, so I should make my arrows longer the closer I am to the bottom. So we can see the force is increasing with depth. 
Now, if we have this thing nailed down so it could pivot right here, what would keep it from tipping over? The mass of the dam itself. Okay, the mass of the dam, you would have a force from the ground pushing up here. That would create a clockwise torque that counters the counterclockwise torque from the water. And the further it sticks out, the bigger the lever arm, and that's the bigger the counter torque you can produce. So the farther it sticks out in this direction, the bigger the counter torque you can produce from the ground. Um, you also have air pressure, which is acting on this surface that's going to give you a counter torque as well. But that's, that's not going to be your, your biggest thing. So you need it for, it needs to be stronger down there and to help you generate the counter torque so it doesn't roll over. Have dams ever rolled over? Yes. There, um, there's a famous, oh, what is it, Mulholland Dam? I don't know. The, a dam, in, anyway, in Southern California, that they put the dam in and they didn't do their, their land survey properly. And the land around the dam was somewhat porous. So they put in the dam and the water goes through the soil around the dam, weakens it, and then the dam came out, which caused a lot of problems. So atmospheric pressure is in here just as 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. If I were to take, eh, I don't have anything to do this. Actually, let me do a couple demonstrations before I move on. You guys are all really young compared to me. Something you should be happy about. When I was a child, we had to use things like this with our car batteries. This is called a hydrometer. And what it does is it measures the density of a fluid. So I have a, an air-filled tube and it has some melted lead down here at the bottom and a piece of paper in here. If I put it in water, it floats. And how can I tell the density of the water? By looking at where the meniscus of the water is on the paper, by measuring how high it floats. Now when we get to Archimedes' principle, we're going to talk about that carefully, how it works. But if this water is more dense, it's going to float higher. If it's less dense, it's going to float lower. Uh, I said that backward, by the way. Okay, when I do that. If it's more dense, it's going to float. Um, okay, now I have to really think. Mm, yes, if the water is more dense, it flows higher. Less dense, it floats lower. Actually, I think I said that right the first time. Yeah, you did. I did, okay. I have to think it through. What's this, then? Uh, what? It's a physics lab hydrometer. Instead of having a glass filled with air, we have just a piece of wood with some copper on it. But you put it in there, and it will also float at a level that depends on the density. And so this here is made so in lab you just um, calibrate it and can measure the density of water. Why did we use this back in the day? I said with our car batteries, because your car batteries are using lead acid cells, not lithium, as you guys tried before class, not nickel cadmium, but lead acid. And so you need battery acid. Well, what happens if you your battery acid is no longer acidic enough? Yeah, your battery doesn't work as well. So you would actually measure the specific gravity, which is basically another term for density, it's slightly different, of the battery acid to determine if you need to put more acid in there or not. Do we still have battery acid in our batteries today? Yes. yes. See my lovely pants? I changed my car battery and I was wearing these pants. And my car battery was bad to the point that Instead of the terminal coming off, you know, you're, you, know the, the, you have a post and you have the terminal that goes on it, I loosened it up and twisted, 
and the whole post rotated. And so I tried to lift up, just hoping that would help, and the whole post came out, and I got splashed with battery acid. Did you do some sort of recovery No, I did not. Did you get your legs here or just your pants? Excuse me? Did it just get your pants or did you get injured? I know, I didn't know. It's just sulfuric acids. H two S O four. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, strong, but excuse me. Yeah, well, I wasn't wise. Okay, let's just let's just move on. New topic. Okay, so our atmospheric pressure is caused by all the air above us. What if I had a hose and I put the hose in the lake, put a cap on it, started lifting the hose up? It's what? It would get heavy. That's a very true statement. If I started lifting it, how is the pressure in the hose going to compare to the pressure in the atmosphere? It's going to get bigger. Okay, the pressure difference for a meter in the hose is going to be density of water times G times one meter. The pressure difference for a uh, meter in the air is density of air times G times one meter. Well, density of air is about one eight hundredth density of water, if I remember right. So my pressure in the hose, it's always going to be atmospheric pressure at the water level. And so as I lift it up, I have the cap on there so the water gets, you know, goes up with it. And so the pressure at the top is going down. So if, for instance, I take that hose, so this is a completely different situation. Here's my water. And here's my garden hose coming up some distance H. And we had pressure atmosphere here, and the pressure inside. What is the pressure inside going to be? Uh, the, the one meter you mentioned? Well, it's a height h now instead of one meter. Oh, but h times, but not the density to grow. Okay, so the, the difference in pressure is rho gh. So we know the pressure right here is atmospheric pressure. How do we know? Go back to what we talked about earlier with the pressure. Caught, if, as long as it's continuous and we don't have any blockages, the pressure at a given elevation is going to be the same in a given fluid. So since it's water continuously from here into here, at the same elevation, it's atmospheric pressure. As we go up, is the pressure going up or down? If you go up to call, to Denver, it goes down. It goes down as you go up in elevation because there's less weight above you. <laughs> and so the pressure up here at the top is going to be atmospheric pressure minus density. What's the density going to be of what material? Water. Water. It's important because we have both water and air in my picture. Yeah, put H there. So the pressure at the top is pressure atmosphere. I see I have two A's there. Don't know how that happened. Oh, no, that's no, fine. It's actually my bar going up to the, my line going up to the T and cursive. It makes it look like a capital A. Pressure atmosphere minus rho water GH. Think about pressure. What direction is the force that pressure makes? Yeah. Always into the surface. Into the surface. So at the top of this, let's imagine that I have just a, a layer of the top I'm looking at. I have the pressure there, and it's pushing up on the top of the, of the um, hose. Well, if I keep raising it, according to that equation, there's going to be a point to where the pressure inside is zero. Right? 
you have a positive number minus a number, you're going to get to a point where it's zero. So let's calculate that. I'm going to call it H max. When pressure in is zero. And so just solving that, I'll have pressure atmosphere minus rho water G H max equals zero. So H max is equal to pressure atmosphere over rho water times G. Now, why would I call that H max? What was my condition for H max? H being the height. When the pressure inside is equal to zero. Now remember I said pressure is always making a force into a surface. If the pressure is zero, it's making no force into a surface. If I were to try to raise it any more, according to that equation, what would happen to the pressure inside? If I make H bigger than H max, what would the pressure inside be? It'd be a negative value. You cannot have a negative pressure. A negative pressure would imply a force pushing out from the surfaces instead of going into the surfaces. The only way to make that happen would be to, <clears throat> to glue it. So you cannot have a negative pressure. The lowest pressure you can have is zero. So we call that lowest pressure a vacuum. And I never check how many C's are in vacuum. I know there's two U's, but I think it's spelled with one C. Okay. So once we get to that height max, if I keep raising the hose, What's going to happen to the water levels? <laughs> if I if I raise it up to H max and then I raise the hose some more, what happens to the water level? It's going to stay the same because it's going to stay with zero pressure at the top. It can't go any negative, and so you just can't draw the water any higher. Now let's just calculate for Grins what this number is. So get out the old calculator, and we're going to put H max for water is equal to pressure atmosphere 1.01, we'll just stop at that, times 10 to the fifth pascals, divide by the density of water. If it's pure water at 4 degrees Celsius, the density is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And then times G, which is 9.80 meters per second squared. What do we get? Ten to the three? Ten point three, okay. I was like ten to the three is kind of big. That's in meters. Ten point three meters, that's in meters. So the highest that you can pull water up is 10.3 meters. Um, By pulling, yes, ever. By pushing, you can go higher. Right, if you make a higher pressure on the bottom, you can lift it higher. But if you're trying to pull it up from above, the highest you can ever get is 10.3 meters. The How move. does that work with your units because it looks like the meters can't go out. Okay. Is news. Oh, wait. Always an important question, not one to be ignored. 1.01 times 10 to the fifth kilogram meters. Okay, a, a newton is kilogram meter per second squared, right? Mm -hmm. But then we're dividing by 1 over meters squared to get pascals. Okay, I see why. I'm still going to finish. <laughs> Okay, to make life easy, 
This meter per second squared cancels with that meter per second squared. This kilogram cancels with that kilogram. And I'm left with that using the old invert and multiply rule for dividing fractions. equals 10.3 meters, right? It's, it's always a good thing to check that. I was just talking to DJ this morning. He was saying, yeah, that's one of the things that I try to focus on with the students. You know, when you get your answer, make sure it makes sense. Make sure your units make sense, so on. So we can only pull the water up that high. Well, imagine we have a tree here. Does that mean a tree can't be more than 10.3 meters tall? Trees are definitely taller than 10.3 meters. You disagree? How does the tree get the water higher than that? So, I just added pressure. Hey, what? I just added pressure. Also, the water evaporates, it makes some pressure. Also, capillary action. Yeah, ca capillary. I mean, I, I was taught this when I was like seven years old going to national parks and having ranger talks. The, the capillarity is pulling the water up and basically you pull it up to here and you put it into a new reservoir you pull it up to here and you put it in a new reservoir so it's not a continuous column from top to bottom because if it was continuous top column from top to bottom you'd have two problems number one is you'd be exploding the bottom of your tree and number two is you wouldn't be able to get up above 10.3 well you, you'd have one or the other you'd either explode your tree or you wouldn't be above 10.3 go ahead my understanding is that hydrostatic pressure does also play a role well, hydrostatic pressure just is everything we're talking about. Okay. So, so yes, it, it does play a role. So, uh, when the water evaporates out from the leaves, it like creates a little bit of a pulse it, it it makes it so you have lower water pressure here. Yeah. And so then it refills. So that is right. To to that extent, yes, yes. All right. Good to know. Everybody got that? that was... <laughs> Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle is a principle we've already been talking about. It's the principle that says that the water pressure at a given elevation will be the same as long as we have a continuous fluid. And so we can use this for some kinds of simple machines. Now, the picture on the right is a picture of the brake system, a drum brake system, for those who care, in a car. So now if you look at that, we have a number of different simple machines. Starting with the foot, what's the first simple machine you see? A lever. A lever. Because we have this is the lever arm for the foot pushing on the brake pedal. And this is the lever arm for that pushing on the master cylinder. Because the, the foot is on a much longer lever arm, you're going to have a mechanical advantage of, and the way the picture is drawn, if we assume that you're pushing straight forward parallel to F1, then we could just take the ratio of the distances, 20 um, centimeters to 4 centimeters. 20 to 4 is 5. So you have a mechanical advantage of 5, which means that if you push with a force of 100 newtons, it's pushing on that master cylinder with a force of 500 newtons, which is a good start. But you push on that master cylinder with a force of 500 newtons, and then that force is applied over an area. And so if you apply that force over an area, what are you applying? A pressure. And so that pressure, in this case, area one, it says, is um, a diameter of 0.5 centimeters, so um, pi r squared. So you take 0.5 divided by 2 to get 0.25. Pi times 0.25 squared is the area. 
and you can calculate the pressure. Now that would be, I know, in centimeters. Then it goes through the brake lines and comes to the brakes. And now you have a cylinder that's 2.5 centimeters in diameter. Five times the diameter. If it's five times the diameter, what's the area proportionally? It's pi r squared, so it'd be 5 squared or 25 times. So you have 25 times the force applied at the brake drums than you had in the master cylinder. So you had a factor of 5 from the mechanical advantage from the lever. Then you have a factor of 25 from the hydraulics by using a bigger diameter, hence having a bigger force for the same pressure. So does that bring a total factor of 125? So that would be a total factor of 5 times 25 is 125. So if we were to put a force of 100 newtons, then that would be 12,500 newtons total. It, it would be, yes, 12,500 newtons total at the output side. Now that's without power brakes. What would power brakes do? Yeah, power brakes, it basically has a pump that adds to the pressure that you're creating to make it even more. So we don't show that in here because it's enough to understand the principle of how this works. Now this here is a simplified form of how a hydraulic lift works when you take your car to have it worked on by a mechanic. They put it on the rack, they raise that rack. That rack is raised using a hydraulic ram. And the simplified version says, instead of having a pump to make the pressure, we're basically gonna have a chamber here and I'm gonna put some rocks on this chamber and it's gonna lift the car. How can I have rocks that weigh a couple hundred pounds lift the car? Okay, if I used a lever, that would have worked. Manipulating distance with an appropriate fulcrum. Here we're going to use Pascal's principle where we have the pressure here is going to be the force of the rocks, the weight of the rocks, divided by the area here. And then if this is at the same height, notice the picture is carefully drawn to make it the same height so we don't have to worry about any difficulties. Then the force that it lifts is going to be that same pressure times the bigger area. So you have pressure equals force one area one equals force two area two. Therefore, force two is equal to force one times area one over area, uh, whoops. Force two, yeah. I force one area one. Yeah, well, that's what was that? Yes, I, I was trying. To, you're right. I was trying to figure out why is that wrong? Force is pressure times area. Yes. Thank you. I knew I had a mistake, and I did not see what it was. So force two, the force you can lift, is equal to force one times area two over area one. That's more like it. So you can lift a heavy car with much lighter stones because of the ratio of the areas. Here is how it really works. Except for this is showing a human-powered lift rather than a machine-powered lift. So you have a tank on the left. That's just got a bunch of oil. And then you have a pump with two valves, valve A and valve B. Valve A and valve B will both only allow oil to flow in this direction. So if I raise my lever up, the volume in here is increasing. I'm going to have oil flow in here when I raise the lever. But then when I lower the lever, 
Valve A is blocked because it's a one-way valve, and it can only go out this way. And so I pump oil from the tank into the cylinder with the car above it, and I have the lever from mechanical advantage, as both Sarah and Randy pointed out. And I have a much bigger area where the car is than I had where the pump is. So with that ratio of the force that I can lift is area two divided by area one times the force I'm using with the lever, I can lift a heavy car. But of course I have to do a lot of pumping to move enough volume of oil to lift at any significant distance. That's why we have little pumps to do it for us because the little pump can move a lot of volume for us to raise the car. Yeah. All right. Kind of off topic, but not really. How does a tire jack work? Like when you twist it and it raises it? Okay. I, I thought you were going to go with this. Then. I was like, exactly the same. No, the ones that rotate. Yeah. I mean, you, you have a screw. Well, the, the kind that you push under and go like this, yeah. that's exactly what this picture is. Uh, what about the twisty ones? But the twisty ones, you have something like this that has a threaded screw in here. Oh, I And so as you turn that screw, it pulls these in. And because it's got pins the thing squeezes up. And you're once again, you're using the, the screw, which is an example of a, an inclined plane. And you're using a lever idea combined in that kind of jack. How do we measure pressure? There's lots of ways. One is the aneroid. That's a simplified or simplified actually more complicated version of the design I showed you in class on Friday for checking the air pressure of the tire. The aneroid you have pressure that moves bellows because you have a force acting on the area and you have a spring to counter that and just measures how much it moves. Or you have the manometer with the Mickey Mouse on it. If you have both sides the same pressure the elevations will be the same. But if one side is a different pressure than the other, the elevations are different. And using the equation we've learned, the pressure difference is rho GH. And so in this case, which side is higher pressure? The side with the Mickey Mouse head or the side open to the atmosphere? Mickey Mouse head, Mickey Mouse head is higher pressure, which pushed this down. This here... So here's pressure atmosphere. And then because we went down, the pressure got bigger by rho GH. What is the density in this case? Density of it depends on what you have in here. It's so whatever the fluid is. So we often use water, but the standard has been mercury. And so you can measure the pressure difference. If it's mercury, you measure the pressure difference by measuring how many millimeters that was. And if it was 10 millimeters, you say, well, the pressure difference is 10 millimeters of mercury. And so we can calculate what a millimeter of mercury is, also known as a tor for Torricelli, equals the density of mercury times G times one millimeter. So what's the density of mercury? 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed times 9.8 meters per second squared. One millimeter is 0 0.01 meters. And so if you multiply that through, that tells you how much pressure one tor is. So since it's time to go, I'll just do it myself. 13,600 times, so you get 
So one millimeter, millimeter, millimeter mercury, 1,333 tor. Or excuse me, I said that backward. One, mil, one, one millimeter mercury is one tor, yes. <laughs> one tor, one millimeter mercury is 1,333 Pascal. Okay, have yourselves a great day. I will try to pick up the pace next time. Well, we'll be doing Archimedes Principle and Lab tomorrow, so I believe that's where my next slide would have started anyway. Oh, um, nope. A couple away. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.